Hey everybody, how's it going? This is part two of my mini-series on printer tuning, and in today's episode, we are going to be talking about filament-specific tuning. Every test in this video should be done for at least each type of filament that you use, and if you want to be extra precise, you can even tune each brand and each color of filament individually. In my case, I'm going to be using Polymaker ASA on my 250mm trident. Before tuning anything, you need to make sure that your filament is dry, as moisture inside the filament will throw off your results and make it very hard to tune. For ABS and ASA, I would highly recommend getting an air fryer to dry your filament. You can find them used for cheap, and they get a lot hotter than most off-the-shelf filament dryers allow. This is my personal setup, the Ninja AF101. I've been using this for well over a year now, and I'm super happy with it. I just place the filament inside, set it to dehydrate, set the temperature as close to 75 C as I can, and let that run for 8 to 12 hours. Basically, I just pop the roll in before I go to bed, and then I take it out sometime in the morning. When a 3D printer extrudes filament, pressure builds up inside the hot end. When the printhead slows down or stops, this pressure can cause excess filament to be extruded, leading to blobs or oozing. Conversely, when the printhead accelerates, it takes a moment for the pressure to build up, which can result in under-extrusion at the start of a move. In real printing, you will most likely notice this in the form of bulging around sharp corners, and you may also notice it in your top layers as well. Thankfully, Pressure Advance helps compensate for these issues, and tuning it is quick and easy. There are loads of different ways to tune Pressure Advance, but I will warn you that a lot of the common methods, like the built-in tuning in Orca Slicer, as well as some online G-code generators, all have issues that will impact your results. I spent the better part of last week tearing my hair out trying to figure out what was wrong, and eventually I settled on just making my own tuning model and using that. I don't want to go on and on about why other tests have issues in this video, but I will make a bonus video talking about just that sometime next week. The test I've come up with is a pretty simple pentagon, with some 90 degree angles as well as some 45 degree angles. The file itself is just solid, so we need to slice it with some specific settings in order to get a usable result. First and foremost, we want no top layers or infill. You don't need any bottom layers either, but keeping at least one will help out with bed adhesion. A thin-walled, relatively tall model like this is a prime candidate to come off the build plate. You could add a brim if you want, but since we need to measure this model later, a brim just kind of gets in the way. For line widths, set all of the values to whatever you normally use for your outer walls. In my case, I'm running 0.5mm since I have a 0.5mm nozzle. Likewise, set your speeds and accelerations to whatever you run for your outer walls as well. Pressure advance values are dependent on your speed and accelerations, so make sure these values are all correct. If you tune for a speed that's different from the actual speed you print at, the results aren't going to be accurate. The number of walls you use is up to you. The key is just to make sure you have enough of them that the part has enough time to properly cool. I made this file on the larger size to help with that as well. My cooling is pretty weak, so trying to do small one wall objects at 300 millimeters a second usually results in me getting a melty blob rather than a useful part. Slice the file and check the G-code preview to make sure the printhead isn't slowing down because of something like a minimum layer time or some other limitation. If everything is good, you're ready to move on. To vary the pressure advance values during the print, we're going to be using the tuning tower command inside of Clipper. This command here is going to raise the pressure advance value by a factor of 0.002 every millimeter. My print is exactly 40 millimeters tall, so over the course of the whole print, you can test values between 0 and 0.08 which is a pretty good range for a direct drive extruder. Let's print the test and take a look at the results. Once the part is done being printed, you're going to want to look around and try to find the sharpest looking corner. At the bottom, you should notice corners bulging out as a result of not enough pressure advance. On the top, you'll see too much pressure advance, which results in under extrusion around these corners. Somewhere between these extremes lies a happy medium, and that's the value we want to find. Once we've identified where the print looks the cleanest, we need to measure the distance from that point to the very bottom of the print. In my case, that looks like about 13 millimeters. Now, to find the pressure advance value we want to use, we simply take that distance and multiply it by the factor that we used in the tuning tower command. So in my case, we have 13 times 0.002, which equals 0.026. And that's what the value of our pressure advance is going to be. Rather than saving this value into your printer.cfg file, I would save it in your filament profile for whatever type of filament you used. 
Remember, this is something you want to tune for at least each different type of filament that you own. The extrusion multiplier, sometimes called EM or simply just flow, is a setting that controls the amount of filament that the extruder pushes through the hot end. For example, a setting of 1.0 or 100% means the printer will extrude the exact amount of filament calculated by the slicer. If the multiplier is increased to 1.05, the printer will extrude 5% more filament than calculated. Conversely, reducing the multiplier to 0.95 will decrease the extrusion by 5%. The easiest way to see the effects of changing the extrusion multiplier is by looking at the top surfaces of your prints, but do be aware that the EM value impacts everything. Orca Slicer has a built-in test for extrusion multiplier, which it calls flow rate, not to be confused with the maximum flow rate testing that we did in the first part. There are two options, pass 1 and pass 2. Pass 1 makes significant changes to the EM in multiples of 20%, Generally, most stock profiles will get you at least within the right ballpark, so I skip pass 1 and go right to pass 2 instead. Pass 2 is a lot more conservative, adjusting the flow by increments of 1%. That lets you really fine-tune the setting. The values here represent the change in flow rate in percent, so negative 7 means 7% 7 less flow than your profile. For something like ABS, a good starting point would be to set the EM to 95%, and then start the test from there. If I was tuning PLA, I would start at 100% and then run the test. From experience, I know that ABS and ASA generally have an EM value around the low to mid 90s, like 92%, and PLA is in the mid to high 90s, closer to 97 or maybe 98%. Starting the test a little bit higher than these normal values is good because it lets you hone in on exactly when the top layers look the best. Once everything is printed, you want to carefully inspect the top surfaces for the best result. You don't want to see any gaps between the lines on the top surface, but also don't want the lines to be over-extruded such that your top surface isn't smooth. It can be helpful to actually feel the tops of these prints as well. You should be able to immediately feel the difference once you get close to the correct value. In my case, negative 2 looks the cleanest, which corresponds to an extrusion multiplier value of 93% since we started at 95. All right, now that we've just finished tuning pressure advance and extrusion multiplier, it's time to tune them all over again. You see, all of these settings impact each other, so for the best results, we need to retune pressure advance and EM once more. The second pass of PA tuning will be done with the extrusion multiplier value that we just found. If you want, you can look at a smaller range of values, since we still know that what we found previously is going to be close to optimal. If you want to be extra precise, you can also decrease the PA factor to help dial in a more precise value. So let's send this one off and see what the results are. Okay, the print has finished, and we can now take a look at the final result. As you can see here, it now looks like the new best value is a little bit lower than last time, closer to 0.024 or maybe 0.025. Not a huge change, but it is slightly different from the previous test. So let's update that value in our filament profile and move on to the next test. This test is going to be exactly the same as the previous test as well. I'll set my multiplier back to 0.95 since I'm using ASA, and I'll run pass 2 again, this time with my new pressure advance value. In general, I'm not expecting a huge difference in results here, but it is good to check again. Here, once again, it looks like negative 2 is still the best, so my final value for EM is going to be 0.93. I'll save that to my filament profile, and now we can move on to some of the remaining tests. On most printers, cooling is the single biggest obstacle when it comes to printing fast at quality. There are two variables to consider here, fan speed and minimum layer time. Fan speed is pretty self-explanatory, running your fans at 100% speed will move more air than running them at 50%. If you're printing PLA, you can probably just set your part cooling fans to be on 100% power all the time and be fine, but ABS and ASA can be a little bit trickier. In a perfect world, I'd be printing ASA in an 80 degree chamber and blasting it with insane amounts of cooling. Unfortunately, my chamber ranges between 60 and 65 degrees C depending on how good of a job I've done with the blanket, and my parts could still warp if I go too hard on the cooling. Generally, this is only an issue on larger, more warp-prone parts, but it's still an issue. You could vary the fan speed depending on the layer time, but since ASA likes to shrink when cooled, having inconsistent cooling tends to result in ugly looking prints, which isn't ideal. So here's what I personally run for ASA. 
I keep my fans running at 50% speed all the time, except for overhangs and bridges. I run 100% speed for those. To make sure every layer gets enough cooling, I'm using a minimum layer time in my slicer, which is the second variable that I mentioned earlier. Minimum layer time is a setting that specifies the shortest amount of time a single layer should take to print. It will make sure that every layer takes at least that long by slowing down the printer accordingly. This is particularly useful when printing small parts or fine details, as otherwise there might not be enough time for the layers to cool properly. Think of the smokestack on a Benchy, for example. We want to find the lowest possible value for our minimum layer time, for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it just means we can print faster. Nobody with a Voron wants to say that it takes them over an hour to print a Benchy. The bigger issue, however, comes back to pressure advance. Since the minimum layer time slows down your prints, you won't be printing at the speeds that you tuned your pressure advance for, and as a result, your print quality will start to suffer. Of course, if your minimum layer time is too low, then you'll also have issues, so we need to find a balance. To do this, I like to print just the very top of a Benchy. I like this because we have a bit of everything. We have some overhangs, some bridging, and of course the smokestack at the very top. I sliced a bunch of these, each time going and decreasing the minimum layer time by just a bit. In the end, I sliced a file for 20 seconds, 15 seconds, 10 seconds, 8 seconds, 4 seconds, 2 seconds, 1 second, and no minimum layer time at all. Some of these files, especially the ones with the longer minimum layer times, were extremely slow and boring to watch, so let's skip all the printing and just look at the results. Here you can see a graph I made, comparing the print time with the minimum layer time that I used on each print. You can see that the minimum layer time has a pretty major impact on the amount of time it takes to print this part. Of course, pure speed isn't the only issue though, we also need to make sure that these parts still look nice. Ironically, the parts with the longer minimum layer time actually look considerably worse than the shorter ones, and this is again because of that pressure advance. You can clearly see that we have some gaps and some other strange artifacts on the sides of the print here. It wasn't until I got down to one second minimum layer time that you could see the smokestack was getting a bit melty. With no minimum layer time, the stack looks downright horrible. There isn't a whole lot of science when it comes to picking a value for your minimum layer time. Just choose whatever looks the best of the bunch. For most people, especially if you print full plates, or at least just a couple of parts at a time, it's probably pretty unlikely you'll be running up against your minimum layer time anyways. In my case, I've settled on 3 seconds to err a bit more on the safe side. I could bring this down a bit lower if I push my speeds to the max, but you run into diminishing returns here pretty quickly. Alright, with our cooling dialed in, let's move on to the final topic of today's video, retraction. While Orca Slicer does have a built-in retraction test, I'm not super fond of using it, and I'll explain why. When you're printing, Pressure Advance usually does a lot of the work during travel moves. Since its whole function is to even out the pressure in the nozzle, there shouldn't be much extra plastic in the nozzle to ooze out and cause stringing if PA is tuned properly. The problem is that, since retraction tests are so tiny, your minimum layer time will kick in and your printer will slow down. Even with my minimum layer time of 3 seconds, I still need to slow down to 20 millimeters per second during the stock test. This is an issue because, as mentioned previously, pressure advance is tuned for a specific printing speed, in my case 300 millimeters per second. Since this test is printed so much slower than normal, my pressure advance is going to be off and the results of the test won't be accurate. My solution here is just to create my own test something I'm going to be referring to as a retraction gauntlet of sorts. Rather than just traveling between two points, I'm going to copy a bunch of cylinders and spread them out all over the whole build plate. The number of different objects you print is up to you, but just make sure to check and make sure that you're actually reaching your normal printing speeds while printing this test. In terms of the settings I use, since I'm running a direct drive setup, I'm going to start with half a millimeter of retraction, and I suspect this will work well. The downside of tuning this way is it undoubtedly takes longer and uses more plastic than the stock test, but I think it's worth it to get more accurate results. If you wanted to, you could print some actual practical models instead of just cylinders here, but make sure to pick something you don't mind coming out a little bit stringy in case your settings are off. If you have some persistent stringing that you just can't seem to tune away, I do have a couple of tips and tricks for you. First and foremost, make sure your filament is dry. Keeping filament dry is something I find most people don't pay enough attention to, but it absolutely makes a difference for something like retraction tuning. 
All of my tests were done within hours of the filament coming out of the dryer, but really, at this point, I should be exclusively printing out of dry boxes. Next on the list, check your Z-Hop settings. Z-Hops make stringing worse, and also make your prints take longer. If you can run without Z-Hops, I definitely recommend it, but even just reducing the height of them can help considerably. I still run 0.2mm of Z-Hop, just in case my parts warp or curl slightly during printing. Once I get my chamber hotter, I won't be as worried about this though. Finally, just increasing the speed of your travel moves can help quite a bit. The filament can't ooze out of the nozzle if it doesn't have time to. As I mentioned in the previous video, I'm running travels at 500mm per second and 20k XL. This seems to be working well for me. Once I get some active cooling on my stepper drivers, I'll up the current and see if I can go even faster still. Would be fun to experiment with. In the end, it looks like I settled on 0.7mm of retraction as being the optimal value for me, and I'm keeping the stock retraction and deretraction speeds of 30mm per second. And this looks quite nice. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions or want to share some tips and tricks of your own, please do leave a comment below. With that said, I'll see you guys in a bit. It's been a pretty busy time for me here, but I'm pleased to report that I finally finished all of my midterms and I can get back to tinkering and, well, not to brag, but I think I have some pretty cool stuff coming soon. You'll just have to wait and see.